Who will be the best reliever in the Reds' bullpen in 2022? Is there a dark horse candidate out there to watch out for? And how did today's CBA negotiations go? We've got all that and more on today's Locked on Reds. Let's go. You are Locked on Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked On Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We are free and available on all platforms. My name is Jeff Carr. I'm your co-host alongside Stephen Offenbaker. We are the Reds fans who are crazy addicted. We love our Reds, and we've turned that addiction into information for you. On today's podcast, we're going to talk about the bullpen. Mm Mm-hmm. It's that time. We're going to talk about who's at the top of this bullpen and whether or not there are some names maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't, that are going to surprise you. Maybe. We'll see. We are talking about the Reds bullpen after all. Plus, we will get into some CBA stuff. The players and owners met for the second day in a row and for multiple hours talked. Not 15 minutes, multiple hours, so that's good to hear. And when we talk about uh, the Reds, though, when we talk about the 2021 Reds specifically, the bullpen was a huge story for all the wrong reasons. A lot of games. I I don't have an exact total as to how many games were adversely affected by the um, unwillingness to go get a bullpen, but we did see some guys pitch pretty well. One of them is actually healthy this year, and Lucas Sims. Is it him and just everybody else, or is there somebody up there at the top for you? Because it, it's, I, I think there's a couple of guys, I, I, I don't know. Like, Lucas Sims for me is obviously the bullpen ace. I think there's three great arms out there, and then uh, a lot of dark horse candidates. As far as Lucas Sims uh, looking at this roster right now, yeah, he is probably the top arm out there. Uh, you know, you and I have talked many times off air that, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the closer designation. I really think in this modern baseball era, uh, you put your best reliever in when you need them the most, uh, regardless of what inning it is. So I don't like that closer ninth inning designation very much, but you know, if we're talking about the top arm in the bullpen, I think, you know, top arm one a is Lucas Sims. And then maybe not very far off of him, top arm 1B would be Luis Sessa, I think. That's how I would rank uh, those two particular arms out in the bullpen. I'd agree with you, and and I also agree, too, with the bullpen ace as opposed to closer. I think of it this way. Who is the number one guy if you're David Bell and you're in a one-run situation where maybe there's guys on base, you're – whoever's on the mound is spent. He's not giving you anything else, but you still have Lucas Sims in the bullpen. It's time to bring him out. I I think he is the most trustworthy option. Maybe let's go with that. The, the highest trustworthy bullpen arm is Lucas Sims. I think that Louis Sessa is right up there with him as well. That slider that he has was just so phenomenally dominant and it's because of its different break. It's not your typical wipeout slider. It just kind of dives in underneath the bat just a little bit it's just enough and then if somebody actually thinks they have a beat on it then it's a ground ball and it's an easy out for the infield so I I love what Luis Sessa brings to the table I'm also kind of looking at some other guys that were here last year that they counted on quite a bit anybody remember Heath Hembry yeah that guy had to pitch a whole bunch and I remember saying this, I and and I'll I'll eat the crow on it because he was terrible in the second half. But pretty much from like the beginning of June to the end of you know the first half of the season, he was the best reliever in the bullpen. And then things changed, and he wasn't that great, and he ends up getting cut and all this other stuff. But he was a non-roster invitee to spring training, a cheap signing. Then you had another cheap signing like Brad Brock, who got a lot of innings. You had a trade that brought Michael Gibbons here. He pitched a lot of innings. You had CNL Perez, who was, (laughs) yeah, yeah. He pitched a lot of innings for whatever reason. You just had all of these guys that were filling holes that had nothing to do with anything and were were stuck here 
and we're stuck here looking at the top of the bullpen like who is going to step up because here's a here's another question for you a guy who was pretty much dubbed as the ace of the bullpen coming out of last year's spring training Amir Garrett struggled mightily is he a kind of guy who can bounce back to the point that he's in this conversation at the top of the bullpen or are we kind of putting him in a dark horse category like we're just hoping he does anything well, I think for specifically for Amir Garrett, I think uh, we should spend some time on him in the next segment because I really do think he's a dark horse. I don't yeah. think that we really know what we're going to get out of him, but I do have some some ideas and I think uh, we can circle back to him. And before we move off of Luis Sessa talking about the top of this bullpen, the 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 best arms that are out there and available, I don't think people realized while it was happening or just weren't ready to give him the credit that he deserved. Uh, he was really good. When he came yeah. over in that trade, I mean, for for you for you folks that still value ERA, uh, he had a two point zero five ERA during his time with the Reds in twenty six and a third inning. the The number that really jumps out at me though, Jeff, is in those twenty six innings, he walked two batters while striking out twenty three. 23 to 2 K to base on ball ratio. He was fantastic. I think that that's why I say it, there, it's not really a competition of is Sims or Sessa the best out there. I think it's a 1A, 1B, and you can interchange them. I think they're both very, very good at the top of this bullpen. That is one thing, too. And it's not to say, like, I love Lucas Sims. He's been on the podcast a couple of times, friend of the podcast. Lucas, you're awesome. There are chinks in his armor, and one of those chinks is every so often he kind of gets into trouble with throwing pitches outside the strike zone and guys not chasing them, and he kind of walks a few guys here and there. The number one thing for any reliever that is a huge pet peeve of mine is to come in and issue walks. Like, there, there's no excuse for it in my mind. If you're a bullpen guy, you come in and you pound the strike zone. Luis Sessa does that two walks in 20, what was it, 23 innings? 26 innings, 26, two walks and 26 innings is absolutely phenomenal. So yeah, yeah, I, I think that that definitely bumps him up in my rankings for me. So yeah, one, a one B, I think it's a good way to look about it. And the more and more I think about these different guys, there's lots of interesting candidates, but I think they all fall in our next segment, which is, you know, some dark horses, some guys who could surprise us, but we're not necessarily expecting amazing things from them. No, I, I agree. I think that uh, as far as being willing to to label somebody uh, the top tier of this bullpen, I, I would be hard pressed to really include anybody else in this category right now. I think as we get into the dark horse conversation, there will be some guys that could pitch their way into that category. But I don't yeah. think there's anybody I'm confident just given that label right now before the first pitch is thrown in 2022. Uh, but coming up, Jeff, I think we can dig into what some of the surprises in this bullpen might be. I have some thoughts. We talked about Amir Garrett already. And there's a couple others that I think could potentially be big, big surprises as we head through the 2022 season. So we'll talk about that coming up in the next segment. But before we talk about that, I want to talk to you about Built Bar. This time of year that everybody has pretty much given up on their New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm sticking with my resolution, and I hope that you are sticking with your resolution as well. Uh, one of those resolutions for me was to eat right, try and stay healthy, and thanks to Built Bar, uh, it feels like this year I can actually keep that resolution a little bit. Built Bar is a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, uh, maybe even better than a candy bar. Built Bar makes it easy to stick to your resolution because it tastes so good, you'll want to eat it. Uh, unlike other protein bars, which can be chalky or waxy or taste like you're taking a drink out of a bucket from a chemical spill, uh, Built Bar is really healthy. It it, it can get it can get so boring to stay healthy. And by like the third week, you're just out of there. But Built Bar is covered in 100% real chocolate. Uh, you, they have amazing health statistics, Jeff. You can eat one of these things and only pick up 130 calories. For you folks that are trying to stay away from some sugar, they only have four grams of sugar and it only results in four net carbs for you keto folks. And they are packed with 17, sometimes 18 grams of protein. Uh, they have amazing flavors like Cherries Barcia, which is my personal favorite. Favorite. You know, I've told you guys a bunch of times that that's what I keep stashed in my locker at work for those overnight shifts to, to get me through the 3 a.m. hungers. Uh, they have great uh, other flavors like coconut brownie chunk. They have salted caramel and they have all different kinds of products as you go through their website. Uh, one of the really good ones are the puffs that are kind of like a three musketeer, but it's like a full size bar that just is is 
built to be very similar to a Three Musketeer. Uh, if you head over to built.com right now and use the promo code LOCKED15, you're going to get 15% off your order. Uh, you're going to be able to to keep your costs down while keeping your diet healthy. And, and you know, dieting can be expensive and Built Bar is helping with that. Again, go over to their website, built.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15 to uh, get started on keeping your New Year's resolution to stay healthy. Uh, make sure you give Locked on MLB prospects a listen after today's podcast. Uh, Lindsey Crosby is a minor league encyclopedia and will keep you up to date on all of the up and coming players. Uh, we've been talking about lots of minor league guys, lots of prospects right now because of the lockout. And uh, once the lockout ends, our focus will shift back to the major leagues. But Lindsey Crosby is going to have you covered for all of the prospects through baseball. He also looks at some of college baseball as well and talks about the guys that are coming up through that system. So that's the Locked On MLB Prospects feed. Uh, it's free and available on all platforms, the same places you get Locked On Reds. Uh, while you're at it, make sure that you're following Jeff and I, as well as the show on Twitter. You can follow me at S. Offenbaker. You can follow Jeff uh, at Jeff Carr. That's Jeff with three Fs. And you can follow the show at Locked On Reds. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. The numbers over there are just going up and up. There's a real community starting to build. And once the season gets started, we're going to have exclusive YouTube content that you can only get right there. So make sure you head over there, click that subscribe button as well. Uh, on tomorrow's episode, Jeff and I are going to do a deep dive on what the Reds might be able to expect from the third base position in 2022. But uh, right now we're focusing on the pitching and specifically the bullpen. Uh, everybody loves to talk about a bullpen in Cincinnati and uh, Jeff and I are no different. Jeff, we've talked about the top flight arms out there, which we have sadly discovered consists of two guys right now. But there are some dark horse candidates out there that could work their way uh, up to that ranking, could work their way up being to uh, being included in that group. And uh, let's just start with Amir Garrett. You brought him up. Obviously, his season last year was a very disappointing season for us as fans. I'm sure it was disappointing to the team. And I know from things that Amir has said publicly, it was very disappointing to him. Uh, what do you foresee him being able to do heading into this 2022 season to get to that, uh, you know, one a ranking or one B ranking or one C ranking for bullpen arms in 2022? Well, the easy thing would be to say that he's going to corral the walks. But to be honest with you, if you look through even the awesome years that he has had leading up to this past season, he still had a decently high walk rate. His strikeout rate just always kind of offset that. And last year, guys weren't chasing anything. That slider that broke out of the zone just absolutely looked like it was never going to touch the strike zone for hitters. And then the fastball was a beach ball that they clobbered over the wall. So it was something that I think he's got to figure out that he did not have that deception factor between those two pitches. That's probably the biggest reason why Luis Sessa's slider is so good because it looks very similar to the way that he throws his fastball. Amir Garrett's not that way. In fact, it looked very obvious to me that it, it was almost to the point where he was like tipping a pitch. And I don't think that they ever came out and said that, but like hitters laid off that slider and just waited on the fastball. They knew he wasn't going to hit the strike zone with it. So he's got to drop the fastball in there to save himself from a walk. And then more times than not, he just ended up walking people because he wasn't going to throw that beach ball. And then there was a lot of guys on the base. That's why you had him coming in. There were like points even in July where it was like, I want to see Amir Garrett in blowouts so he can start working on his confidence. And then little by little, those blowouts became closer games because he just kept loading the bases with walks and, and, and easy hits and just bad, bad pitching. So I think a lot of it probably stems from the ability to make his fastball and his slider in some way, shape, or form, whether it's delivery, mechanics, release points, something. There must be a bigger deception factor there. And I think we'll see an Amir Garrett much closer to what we saw in 2019 and 2020. I really hope so. And I think you did hit on probably the two biggest issues that he had last season. Um, obviously, the walk is a problem. He walked 29 guys in 47 innings. That's 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 not getting it done. It's just simply <laughs> not going to get it done. Uh, and you talk about his fastball, the you know, most relievers throw two pitches. Uh, some of the exceptions are guys like Michael Lorenzen, who deep down just want to be a starter anyway and want to continue to work on. Uh, having a, a nice array of pitches, but most relievers come out there with their, their number one and their number two, and that's pretty much it. 
The thing for Amir that he has got to get nailed down before this season starts is being able to locate that fastball, being able to blow it by people and get strikes with it so that they will chase that slider because that slider really is a chase pitch. Um, even with guys like Luis Castillo and, and, and other guys that are throwing their chase pitch, you know, for Luis, it's that changeup that you know is going to be out of the zone. I know it, you know it, the hitter knows it, but they can't help it. And right. that's because he sets it up with his other pitches. And that's what Amir really needs to do. He needs to set up that slider with the fastball, keep people off balance, because if you know the ball is going to be in the dirt, you finally can just train yourself not to swing. And I think that's what happened to him. Uh, can he do that? I don't know. If he does, he will be, you know, move out of this dark horse category and you know be a solid lefty out of the pin that can be considered that one of the top tier pitchers that david bell will look to as the game progresses on and to be honest with you the, the reason that we're calling him a dark horse is not because we don't we think he's coming out of nowhere we know where amir garrett's coming from he's in the bounce back category but the reason that he is in this part of our conversation is because we're not expecting him to be one of the top guys we saw a lot last year from him and we saw him continue to struggle and every time he thought he was about to figure it out more struggles came through so that's kind of why we have him in this category another guy that we have in the dark horse category for a totally different reason is a dude that i want to talk about and that's our Warren. Art Warren had some really good stuff last year. He was able to mix his pitches very well. I don't think he got a huge run. Part of that probably was because he was on the fringes and there were some other guys that decided to take over and they needed roster spots for one reason or the other. And he just never got as much of a run. I think he's going to get more of it this year. And I think he's going to take that and run with it. I think he could be a guy that when you look at this group of pitchers that we're talking about right now, he's got probably one of the best shots to make that trek into the upper echelon of the Reds bullpen. Well, let's talk about what he did when he did get an opportunity in Cincinnati. He managed to get into 26 games, Jeff. He pitched 21 innings in those 26 games. Uh, you know, the numbers that we like to talk about uh, in his 26 appearances, he struck out 34 guys and walked only eight. So again, that strikeout to walk ratio for these relievers is, I think, key in determining if they're going to be successful and if the Reds are going to be successful. You know, for the ERA guys, Warren's ERA was 1.29 during that time. Uh, ERA plus, which I don't know how much stock I put in that statistic, but it was 375. So it's a little, it's a little, there's a little wiggle room in that one. But, you know, all things being considered, you know, he was one of the better rankings in the Reds bullpen in 2021. So, you know, I'm right there with you. He was the next guy on my list too, Jeff. I think that if given an opportunity and used in the correct situations, uh, he could be another one of those bright spots in the 2022 bullpen. And I think, you know, it's a small sample size, so it's not to say that this is indicative of what he would have done had he given more opportunities, but in those 21 innings, he had a strikeouts per nine of 14.6. And if you look at Reds relievers who got 20 or more innings pitch, which it's a lot of them because let's be honest, they were just throwing darts for most of the year trying to figure out who on earth they can trust in that bullpen. But he had... 14.6, which was the best amongst any Reds really actually tied for the best with Lucas Sims amongst any Reds reliever with over 20 innings pitched. So there's something to be said about Art Warren and what he could bring to the table this year. Another guy that I'm looking at, and this dude, I mean, we could probably do a whole, a whole episode on this guy, and I'm looking forward to seeing him in spring training and seeing him get going in the early part of the season. And that's Tony Santion. Tony Santion could be anything from a really solid fifth starter to maybe this team's closer by the end of the year. I mean, he has the talent to do both. We saw that amazing, uh, I don't even know, it was like a curveball, a slide or something. It, it was a breaking pitch that was phenomenal. Just wipe out, getting people out of there. They swung, and then all of a sudden it was like in the first the first base coach's box. And they're like, what the hell? This thing's, why did I even swing at this? And then his fastball, he's able to locate exactly where he needs it. He's a guy that once he got into the bullpen, and this is probably where I think he has his most value, is once he got into the bullpen, he really flourished. If you look at his splits, his bullpen statistics are just absolutely phenomenal. And a guy that I'm going to be watching all year long and kind of keeping tabs on because I think he, he was 
his prospect profile for years was he's going to be in the rotation. He's going to be a great starter, but I really liked what he brought to the table out of the bullpen and with the other guys that the Reds have in this rotation and who could make this rotation, I think he might be more valuable out of the bullpen. Oh, I think so too. And you know, you and I had the opportunity to discuss this with Carlos Guevara and Tim Daniel when we did late night Reds talk earlier this week. And, you know, I said then, and I will say again, I do not want the Reds messing with Tony Santion. I want him in the bullpen. I want him to keep doing what he was doing uh, yes. towards the end of last year. I think that there is enough promising starting rotation type arms in the minor league system right now, ready to come up or on the edge of being ready to come up that they cannot mess with Tony Santiago. I want him out there. I want him to keep doing what he's doing. I want him to keep working with Derek Johnson and just continue to be a, a shutdown reliever for this team because they need it. And I mean, honestly, if he had just a little bit more time uh, in the bullpen last year, I'd have put him up there in that uh, most reliable arms category with yeah. Sessa and Sims because he was just really phenomenal coming out of that pin. He, he became a whole different pitcher when they moved him from the rotation to the bullpen. And I was initially against it because I did think he showed a little bit of promise as a starting pitcher, but man, once he got rolling, he was lights out and I want more of that. Tony two bags. I remember when he started, he hit a double. That was, that was kind of cool. So I'm always going to call him Tony two bags. I don't think anybody else will because I'm stupid, but yeah, uh, there's a couple of other guys, not necessarily dudes that I have a whole lot of like feelings on. I, I just, I I'm a little bit more hopeful with these guys. Number one is Dowry Moretta because we've heard all the stuff that he's done in the minor leagues and he got a tiny little sample size run there at the end of September, which you can look at the stats. It's not going to tell you a whole lot because it was only like, I don't know, two or three appearances. But I liked what I saw, and I want to see more of it. I thought his fastball had a lot of life, and I think he's got a real shot. Now, he also has a wide range of, range of outcomes. He could be a dude who has command problems, a dude who just does not get people to swing and miss and ends up walking a lot and giving up a lot of hits. I could see that happening. And then another dude is Graham Ashcraft. He could come up and really make an impact in the bullpen. The biggest question with him is what's his development look like? Does he look like he's developing into a starting pitcher? And then the question becomes, do you waste time service time on him with him pitching out of the bullpen? Or do you kind of make sure, you know, you're going to bring him into that rotation role that those are guys that are a little bit further down the road and probably guys we won't have answers on until middle to late season. But I still would like to see what they could do for this team. I just, I don't know that there's much more out there because I mean, who else we got Jeff Hoffman. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> oh god no mm -hmm. you know talking about moretta i think what was most confounding with him last season jeff is he was he was absolutely just shredding hitters in the minor he leagues was. last season he definitely while was. <laughs> while the reds bullpen was just getting shelled and <laughs> i for the life of me can't understand what took them so long to bring him up. I mean, it wasn't a case of injury because he just kept going out there and pitching every day in the minor leagues and just never got the call. I think that uh, he has a real opportunity to, to make this bullpen out of spring training this year. Uh, you know, again, we didn't, like you said, we didn't see a whole lot at the big league level from him last season. He only got about three innings worth of work, but what he was doing in the minor leagues was enough for me to say he needs a real shot at being with this team uh, when it breaks camp, whatever that might look like. And as far as Graham Ashcraft goes, uh, you know, I really think he's probably a year away, Jeff. And I think some of that is just because there's so many other young arms that the Reds are going to be looking at and giving their first shots to this year that I think you know, because of that, they can take just a little bit more time with Graham and see if he's going to be a starter or if he's going to be a shutdown reliever and, and really take a solid look at him in Louisville and, and see what they've got for a potential uh, addition to the team, either late for a September call up or at the beginning of 2023. I really think that's how things are going to play out with him. Yeah, because, I mean, the meteoric rise he had through everybody's prospect lists last season, I think, needs to be measured a little bit, and he needs to see some AAA hitting. That's that's one thing that it's always kind of hit or miss with stuff. Like, I look at Hunter Green, and I'm like, there's nothing more we're going to learn from him pitching in AAA. He needs to be in the majors, you know, so long as you know, the spring training thing works out and all that. But when it comes to Graham Ashcraft, give me some time in AAA before the Reds go ahead and make that call, especially with – 
some things like that because he's got rotation upside. I think that some other guys like, I mean, obviously Dalry Moretta was always going to be a relief pitcher. Tony Santion looks like he's going to be a relief pitcher for the rest of his career and things like that. So those are guys that I'm totally okay with you rolling there and, and seeing what you got. I, I, the bullpen is going to be a topic that we talk about all season long. And I think one of the biggest reasons for it is because it's um, not very deep. Uh, so help will probably need to come from either completely unlikely candidates, people we haven't even talked about, or Mr. Outside Hire. Uh, coming up, the owners and players met again for multiple hours down in Florida talking CBA. We're going to tell you exactly what they did. We're going to kind of recap what happened on yesterday's meetings and uh, how we're feeling about all of that. Before that, though, I want to tell you where you can get the best sports wagering info, and that's BetOnline. BetOnline.net has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. There's no more football. It's all basketball now. we got college basketball is starting to really ramp into the co- uh, the uh, conference championship season. And then we've got March Madness right around the corner. Woo-hoo. The NBA just got done with the All-Star break, and they're back into full swing of games and stuff like that. People are talking about Le- LeBron. Is he happy with L.A.? Is he not? I don't know. Whatever. LeBron's. LeBron. And then we've got NHL and boxing and UFC, all kinds of great stuff that you can find at betonline.net because betonline.net remains the best spot for all your sports scores and news and news about odds and props and lines and all of that great stuff throughout all of the sports seasons. And uh, also, as we're, we're rolling into hopefully the end of the lockout, we're looking at spring training. Uh, we're going to have some great futures and stuff like that you, you can find at betonline.net. We'll see what they have. I, I think I heard the other day that one website, I, I, BetOnline, doesn't currently have it out. But once they do have it out, I'm sure it's going to be around 77 and a half wins for the Reds. Be interesting to see if they keep it there, if they go up higher than that. I think I'd take the over at this point, but eh, who knows? There's some moves that are probably going to happen that change that. And don't wait to take advantage, though, of all the great offers that BetOnline.net has for you right now this season. BetOnline is where the game starts. Thanks again for making Locked on Reds your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. Make sure that you are subscribed. That way you don't miss anything that we've got for you on your favorite podcasting apps. And follow us on YouTube as well because we've got a lot of great stuff that's going to be coming for you that is YouTube specific and will not go out over the podcasting app. So check us out at Locked on Reds on YouTube. All right, Steve, uh, day two of the marathon, the absolute gauntlet, the whatever they, they talked for a couple of hours. I think they talked for like an hour and then they had an intermission. It was like, Oh yeah, you guys really talked for a long time, but they talked a lot, which is good to know. And some things were conceded by the players. Cause this was, so the owners kind of made their proposals on Monday. The players made their counter proposals today. And they did make some concessions in a couple of key areas that the talks are at least moving forward and they're going to be back tomorrow. What was the biggest thing for you that you had seen out of the reporting? Well, you know, the the biggest thing for me is that we actually did get conversation for the second day in a row and it was substantive and it, it took it took an up. Uh, a long amount of time. It took three hours. So that was the biggest takeaway. Now, as far as the, the moves, the concessions, the, the give that was presented, you know, there's, there's some backlash on Twitter and, and from some other outlets that, you know, everybody's just making these tiny moves and it's going to take forever. And I don't see it that way. I think there's still, you know, keep in mind, uh, they really have not met and they really have not done serious negotiating up until this point. I think the last couple of days has really been a lot of get to know you as far as where there may be able to perceive a willingness to move versus areas that it's clear that there's not going to be any moves. I think they'll come back again tomorrow. There'll be some more small moves. And then as we head into Thursday and Friday, I think they'll start tackling the big issues. And it is my hope. That once we reach Friday, they're going to be talking about the big, big things in an effort to get something out to the players to vote on over the weekend. Uh, They're still on track for that. Uh, It's not quite yet in danger of being lost, but they do need to pick up the pace just a little bit as we head into Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. 
Yeah, I, I look at this as like a trade deadline negotiation. It's it's kind of right now you've got two sides that are trying to make their offer that is the most friendly to them without making too many concessions right away. I think that probably by the time Friday rolls around, we'll really start to see that. As they continue to report, they're not even budging. Neither side is really making concessions about the co- competitive uh, balance tax that goes on with uh, the tax threshold and things like that. So that's a huge thing that actually has to be talked about, and they just haven't started there. But, you know, the players came down one on the lottery ask. The players had wanted eight teams to be part of the draft lottery. Now they ask for the bottom seven. Uh, They have reduced their ask for the percentage of Super 2 players to be eligible for that Super 2 status from 80% to 75%. Currently, I think that's only at like 20%. So that's where the big divide is between what the owners want and what the players want because the owners want the status quo in pretty much all situations. So, And, and then the uh, with that, the players also upped their ask for the minimum salary for guys that are in their arbitration year. So there were reports that the owners weren't that happy about that they thought that okay well you make a concession over here but then you raise this over here again in the grand scheme of things it's one percent we're talking about a small raise in the big picture and really that's what we're worried about here is the big picture and what does the big picture look like for the game of baseball moving forward because this is a sport that cannot stand to see a delayed start to this season for a myriad of reasons i was reminded today i mean talk about the finley market parade as of right now, they cannot accept, and they they are not accepting brand new applications. The only applications that they're accepting for the parade are people who were trying to get into the parade in 2020 and last year. So if, if there's a new business that wants to jump in, they can't right now because they're like, look, we don't know if opening day is happening on March 31st and we're not going to plan for something that then has to be moved back. So it's, it's causing upheaval in more than just the baseball stadiums and those of us who want to be in them on March 31st. You know, I think that's the, the piece of it, Jeff, that when we talk about, are you team, team players, team owners, you know, where do you come down on this? The people that I really do feel bad for are the people that make their living, uh, secondary to the game that, you know, the, the restaurants downtown, the, the people that go and work in the concession stands, the people that, you know, a lot of their yearly income comes from that period of baseball season. And, you know, those guys have, have had a rough couple of years. And I really hope that major league baseball and the players association get something done. Let's start on time. Let's get that back to what it looked like as close to 2019 as possible. And and let's roll and let's, let's get these people the support that they've been just begging for and waiting for because, you know, they've hung on a long time and, and now's the time that I think they need to be rewarded for hanging on. So hopefully it gets done quick. And it's getting annoying to us, too, because we have some big plans for opening day that we can't wait to tell you about. We just got to figure out if opening day is actually going to happen on that day. Oh, I can't. So I can't there's a small, people, tease, small tease. Small tease. <laughs> I big can't things. wait. Big, big things. Big things. It's, I'm so excited. <laughs> so excited. You listen, that's probably a great spot to wrap up for today, Jeff. We'll, we'll let people wonder what we're up to because there is good stuff coming for opening day if it's on time, let me tell you. Uh, but that's going to do it. Coming up on the next podcast, Jeff, I think we're going to dig in a little bit onto what third base could look like for the Reds in the 2022 season. Uh, that's a definitely a position uh, that has a lot of question marks surrounding it. We will also keep everybody up to date on the latest talks from the collective bargaining agreement negotiations uh, as the players and the owners continue to meet every Every day. Thanks so much for making Locked On Reds your first listen of the day. Now make Locked On Bets your second listen. Q and Lee Sterling give you the info you need to make some cash at betonline.ag every single day. That's Locked On Bets, just like Locked On Reds, and it's free and available on all platforms. Jeff, it's still the off season, and we are still locked out. But what are we? We are Locked On Reds every single day. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't think that was executed well. <laughs>